Shalom, friends. Thank you so much for being here. We're so delighted to learn with you today and with Rabbi Rachel Adler, the David Ellenson Professor of Modern Jewish Thought Emerita at Hebrew Union College, LA, was one of the first to integrate feminist perspectives into interpreting Jewish texts and law. Her book, Engendering Judaism in 1998, is the first by a female theologian to win a National Jewish Book Award for Jewish thought. It's hard to believe, 1998. She has published over 60 articles on Jewish thought, law, and gender, and on suffering and lament in Jewish tradition, as well as the whimsical tales of the Holy Mysticat, a prize-winning resource for adult Jewish education, of which I had the pleasure of, of interviewing uh, Rabbi Adler about uh, just a few years ago, which you can find at our Valley Beat Midrash Learning Library. <clears throat> so Rabbi Dr. Rachel Adler, thank you so much for being with us today uh, to learn with you. Friends, as usual, we'll have about 35 to 40 minutes uh, to learn from Professor Adler and then the chance to open up the conversation. Okay, nice to be here and let's get started. This is, um, uh, going to be an intricate thing we're doing. Um, so we start out with the commonest question that people have when they have misfortunes. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? And there are many, many answers to that question in biblical and rabbinic literature. Um, and we're going to examine a particular one. A good thing to remember about Talmud is that it's not like a Western book where you have one authoritative voice telling you what's what. Instead, it is a multivocal text. There are many voices and they might all be right. That's an unusual idea for us who have had Western educations. So the other thing that is unusual here is that we have an unusual kind of Mishnah. Usually Mishnah is legal material. This is an agotic Mishnah. It is about the formation of perspectives and attitudes and, and not about legal decision-making. In fact, most of the uh, behavior that the Mishnah addresses is behavior that occurred when no male was around. Um, we'll see that there is um, there's a, a, a major change in tone when uh, the Gemara starts to address the question of what, what does it mean when bad stuff happens to men? So let's, let's get going. Um, by the way, this Mishnah, I think, was meant to be overheard by women. Um, we know that there were often women around when men were learning. Many rabbis taught in their own homes. Even in uh, the uh, Beit Midrash or in the Beit Knesset, women were pr present, separate from the men, sometimes nursing their children there, but present. So um, what this Agadah seems to want to do, this Mishnah, uh, is inculcate the idea that God is watching even when rabbinic men are not. So let's take a look at the Mishnah itself. It's a short Mishnah. Could we have that Mishnah, please? Uh, Eddie, could you start screen sharing that Mishnah? Yep, on my way. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna move on because we haven't got time. 
Al shalosh aveirot, nashim meitot b'sha'at le'datan. There we are. See where it says uh, Mishnah, um, we're next to the Gimel. All right. Um, it, uh, for three sins, women die in childbirth. Um, and they, then it enumerates what those are. Al she'enan zehirot benida v'chala u'v'hadlaka taner. Um, that's kind of strange language because they are not careful about uh, nida, the laws about um, uh, menstruation, uh, about uh, hala, uh, taking of the portion of dough that would have been the priestly portion, and lighting uh, the lamp. Um, so um, you need to understand that uh, uh, we can let's let's get that off for a minute, Eddie, if we can, please. Okay, so um, we need to understand that childbirth in the ancient world was a major cause of death for uh, women. You can see that in the excavated remains of ancient uh, cemeteries. Either there was an infection or a problem in delivery. Sometimes the girl who was bearing the child was immature and the birth canal was too narrow to permit delivery. So the classical te texts assume that men are going to outlive one or more wives. This um, uh, chapter that we're, uh, this Mishnah that we're learning is in the chapter in uh, Tractate Shabbat um, uh, called Bame Madlikin. And its central issue is lighting the Shabbat lights. And those wouldn't have been candles, remember, they would have been oil lamps. And uh, the defining, a defining feature of pre-Rabbinic uh, uh, Judaism is that the, the Rabbinites um, made a rule that you had to light lights in your dwelling place before um, Shabbat. Um, I think uh, that Sadducees, maybe they just kicked each other in the dark and swore a lot. I don't know what they did, but um, uh, this is what, this beautified Shabbat uh, in rabbinic Judaism. Uh, now, note the language then. Um, it says the women deserve to die because they were not zihirot, because they were not careful. In other words, the Mishnah here is presuming that a sin arising out of carelessness rather than intentional violation is nevertheless punishable by death, but only in the case of women. Nobody could receive a death sentence from a court on these grounds, but the Mishnah is attributing that kind of death sentence to God. Why? Now, legally, these acts are not what are popularly called women's mitzvot. There isn't a uh, mitzvah of uh, searching for menstrual blood, um, uh, just as mikvah immersion isn't a mitzvah in itself. If you want to be, if the, uh, the women are to be permissible for sexual intercourse, which is prerequisite to the male mitzvah of um, uh, increasing and multiplying, then they have to have seven clean days after menstruation and immerse. Um, and uh, actually even the seven days is a sort of um, uh, later rabbinic legisla legislation. Um, the, uh, so the analogy would be uh, that there isn't a mitzvah that says thou shalt eat meat. But if you want to eat meat, you have to uh, get a meat from a kosher species and have it um, slaughtered properly. Uh, as for hala and hadlakataner, they're 
uh, mitzvot that have to be done for bread to be permissible and for households to have light on Shabbat. So uh, anybody who's baking bread or available to light the lamp is supposed to do so. And generally those tasks were allotted to women and generally men weren't around to supervise. Uh, women had to be trusted, but the, this Mishnah distrusts women. And so its answer is to terrify them into obedience, even when men aren't around to watch them by telling them that God will punish their uh, carelessness with death. In other words, this is a theological Mishnah and legally it hasn't got a leg to stand on. So the Gemara needs to check up on the reasoning. Big time. Let's, um, Eddie, can we have that Gemara back? Um, let's, let's take a look at, at that Gemara. Okay, could you scroll up a little bit? Um, all right, so what we got here is, um, the, what's, what's the reason uh, uh, regarding uh, Nida. Uh, Amar Rav Yosef, he kill kala bechadurei bitna lefichach tilke bechadurei bitna. Here's a, a nice um, uh, uh, parallel thing. The punishment fits the crime. Uh, it, it, uh, it, there's a symmetry, um, uh, uh, all focused on this necessary but disgusting piece of equipment that women have that coincidentally men do not. Um, uh, the, uh, she, uh, you know, screwed up uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, her, uh, her womb, uh, and so she's uh, punished by means of the, uh, the womb, by death and childbirth. Um, uh, so, um, but uh, as we go on, we're going to see it, it gets a lot less symmetrical. Chala, uh, the hadlakata ner, my, well, so what about chala and lighting the uh, the lamp? My ika lememar. What can be said about those? He did drash ha huga galilaa ale rav chista. This a Galilean, uh, this uh, uh, who is not named, taught in front of rav. Chista, uh, the, the following teaching. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One said, Revi'it dam natati b'chem al iske dam his hearty etchem. I placed a quarter of a uh, log of blood in you when you were formed and therefore uh, I, I'm entitled to um, uh, uh, command you about matters of blood. Um, that's not such a good proof text. Uh, it's not such a good proof te text because it's not a tight fit. When I say not a tight fit, I mean, uh, it's kind of like if you went to court over a parking ticket, your lawyer is going to be most successful if the lawyer argues from parking regulations. If, if the, the lawyer tries to cite the Bill of Rights, that's legally not a tight fit and probably, uh, you know, not as, as good a legal argument. Um, uh, so uh, then um, uh, we've uh, we've got um, 
uh, that was the uh, the argument uh, the argument about um, uh, about the uh, blood. Um, uh, let's uh, can we move on to the next page? Great. Uh, thank you. So now we've got um, uh, the question of uh, uh, Hala, and uh, we and we're it, it's being compared to uh, uh, Rashid, uh the uh, uh, the. Um, Uh, I, I want to go back for a minute and say something about uh, uh, about the blood. Um, there are a lot of rules about blood, uh, uh, and and uh, not all the violations result in death sentences. Um, uh, shochtim, uh, ritual slaughterers, aren't struck dead because they messed up a shechita. Manslaughterers who by definition didn't intend to kill aren't executed. So now uh, that's, th that's why that's a kind of sloppy proof. Uh, then we have this matter of reshit. Uh, in other words, that God calls the people of Israel God's first fruits. And, um, and that is what entitles God um, to um, uh, legislate about first fruits, and in that legislation, um, the uh, uh, the Galilean is including challah. It didn't even mention challah. So this is another uh, kind of uh, not very uh, uh, stable. Uh, 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 connection. Um, and uh, the argument, the argument uh, seems to be um, uh, uh, look, uh, let me get back to uh, th this text here uh, and, and take a look at where we are with Hadlakat uh, Haner. Um, uh, which is um, uh, uh, which which is uh, uh, you know God uh, placed um, uh, uh, God placed um, uh, uh, in you the uh, nishama. Uh, Nishama uh, shedatati v'chem kruyadner is is called a lamp, uh, and there and that's God's uh, justification for commanding al iskein ner his halti etchem, and therefore things concerning lights I uh, am entitled to command you. Im atem mekaynim otam mutab. If you uh, if you fulfill those, great. The uh, im love, and if not, hineni no tel nishmat nishmatchem. I'll uh, take your soul away from you uh, if if you didn't do it. Well, um, that. Also, um, uh, is uh, a, a kind of um, uh, problematic proof text. Uh, first of all, Hadlakat uh, Nerot, lighting the lamps, uh, is uh, rabbinic law and not even uh, Torah law. And uh, the analogy of the soul as a, a lamp seems to be saying, because God made you any time you don't fulfill a mitzvah, God is entitled to kill you. And that's really an untenable uh, contention. And so uh, the rabbis 
interestingly, don't comment Tenach as they did concerning Nida. They don't say that's an acceptable argument. That takes care of it um, uh, from the Shoresh Noach uh, as they do on Nida. So instead, they politely change the subject. And when they change the subject, um, what they ask is why in childbirth? Why shouldn't God strike a sinner dead precisely at the moment of the crime? Um, but of course, that's counterfactual. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, there'll have to be an effort to prove that childbirth isn't just a natural danger, but also a time for punishment. So uh, uh, what we get here are uh, five different explanations. Um, we, we get uh, first uh, Rava, um, who's who says um, who says um, when the ox uh, is uh, fallen, sharpen the knife. Um, in other words, childbirth is a convenient uh, opportunity for punishment because the woman, like the fallen ox, is already vulnerable. Uh, then uh, we get um, uh, uh, Abaye, who uh, who says, um, "Tapesh atiros em amta v'chad machtara le." Uh, um, uh, now, uh, which translates um, uh, 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 let let the maid servant um, uh, err. Uh, multiple times uh, with one beating, uh, uh, they, uh, all of those um, sins uh, will, be, uh, will be punished. So Abaye's concern is why three sins would receive only one punishment. If there were a way for God to kill the woman three times, that would be much more symmetrical to a baye. But he draws a real life analogy from his own experience. You wait until several offenses have piled up, and then you beat the crap out of the maidservant. And uh, here, uh, this language was very difficult. Uh, tapish means tarbet, let increase. And teus means pesha, or sin or fault. Let the sin or fault of the amta, the female slave, increase with one machtera beating from a chatar, a rod. It will be punished. So there, uh, the two inferences that I get from Abaye's interpretation is one: don't take a job in Abaye's household, and two. Abaye seems to have constructed an abusing God in his own image. So now we have uh, Rav Chista um, uh, here, uh, who um, Rav Chista Amar Shvike Leravaya. Did me nafshe nafel. So 
leave the drunk alone because he'll fall by himself. So Rav Chista here seems to believe that ordinarily childbirth would invariably be fatal. All God has to do is withhold divine providence to rescue the woman, not just uh, let nature take its course and she'll die. So now we've got um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, someone is commenting that Abaye sounds like a gem. Uh, he's apparently not, he's not always like this, but uh, this is certainly not a very pretty picture in this uh, uh, sugya that we're looking at. Um, so Marukva, Marukva Amar, uh, I, I'm I having a little trouble with uh, uh, seeing this. It's a little um, small, uh, but um, uh, he, he, yeah, all right, here. Um, so uh, no, um, I need you to move over on one uh, page 130. That's great. All right, uh, no, uh, yeah, that's it, uh, one, yeah, so um, uh, Mar Ukva, um, uh, Mar Ukva is an interesting psychological case. Mar Ukva Mar, Ayat Chigra, the uh, shepherd is lame, Vize Rihatan, and the uh, you know sheep or goats are frisky. Uh, Above uh, Hutra, uh, uh, um, above Hutra Mile, uh, the above Dare Hushpana. So um, uh, the shepherd is crippled, the goats are running, he can't catch them. Ne next to, uh, 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 outside the, um, the, um, uh, Outside the the fold, um, uh, uh, he he just has to uh, coax them in, and uh, so uh, and inside the uh, the uh, fold he can beat them. Uh, so here's God as a lame shepherd, and women are as goats who are all over the place, and uh, and uh, God can only beat them up once he's gotten them cornered in the fold. Uh, possibly a little projection about how helpless Marukva feels about women's autonomy. Um, uh, so uh, now we have Rav Papa. Rav Papa Amar, Abav Chenvata Nefiche Ache Umarachme um, uh, at the gate of the uh, shop, um, uh, there is now uh, you need to understand that he's changing the discourse here. Um, the comment could apply to both men and women, maybe more so to men. At the gate of the shop, now, men socialized in shops, maybe more so than women. Um, uh, so at the gate of the shop, there are, uh, there are um, uh, brothers and, and friends above Bizione uh, at the uh, gate of um, Biziona, uh, which can mean, according to Jastro, a prison, solitary confinement, or public disgrace. Um, at, at that gate, there are no uh, uh, brothers or friends. Uh, then the sociality falls away and the sufferer is all alone. And that applies to everyone. Um, so what, what's going to happen here is we just got a kind of turnaround 
And the Gemara is going to start focusing on the important and normative sufferers, men. And the language changes, uh, not uh, how or when or why are they punished or killed, but um, it, it, it's going to say, uh, the Gavre men, how are they tested or evaluated? Um, and we get a very cryptic answer from Reish Lakish, who says, Bisha'ah she'ovrim al hageshav. When they cross over a bridge, and the editorial voice of the sugya is incredulous. It says, Geshe Vetula, Gesher, a, a bridge, that's it, and is answered, Ema Ke'en Gesher, something like a bridge. Now, a bridge is a point of transition. Nobody lives on a bridge. A bridge is a way to get from one point to another. And you'll note that half of the Amoraic authorities who are quoted here are in Babylonia. So, uh, Eddie, would you please show us that map for a minute? Uh, and then we can go back to this page, but let's have the map. Uh, let's see if we can have a map. Why are they, why would a bridge be such a powerful symbol to them? Um, uh, all right. Basically, if you take a look at this, this is a map of all of the Jewish communities of Bavel. And what you can see is that they're all clustered along the banks of both sides of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, all along the banks. So um, uh, I think we're done with that now, Eddie, but thank you. You can see that if you wanted to get from one Jewish community to another, you had to cross water. Now, um, also, you know, so, uh, some of those uh, um, uh, uh, authorities we know traveled between Israel and uh, Babylonia. So all of the authorities have probably got some experience with traveling on water. And there is a difference between Eretz Yisrael and Babylonia here. Uh, Eretz Yisrael, like other parts of the Roman Empire, uh, there were a lot of bridges that were stone that were expertly engineered because that's what the Romans were good at. And in Europe, some of those bridges are still standing and still in use. But Bavel, Babylonia didn't have a lot of stone. Even its stone bridges were not as well engineered and other bridges were built out of waterproofed reeds and were not altogether reliable. Um, also note that there exists a word gaishar, which um, sounds as if it should be translated bridger. Uh, but it's not a bridger, uh, and it's not, in fact, usually a bridge keeper. It usually is used to mean a ferry operator. One way to cross a river in Bavel is to go in a ferry boat. But this also has some built-in uncertainties, depending on the condition of the ferry, and the competence of the operator. 
And the reason, as we said, that you would need to do all of this crossing water is because if you wanted to get from one Jewish community to another, that's what you'd need to do. So I'm going to propose the, uh, that bridges and ferries get uh, conflated uh, in this sugya. And that's why we're going to move on to the precautions uh, that great rabbis took um, getting from one place to another. Now, if we could have um, that uh, text back again. Uh, that the page that we were that we were on before. All right. So uh, so we've got a number of strategies here for um, uh, crossing. Uh, either crossing a bridge or getting in a uh, ferry boat. Um, and uh, I, we've got um, uh, we've we've got um, uh, Rav, um, uh, we've got uh, Rav um, who would not, cross a river in a ferry in which uh, a non-Jew was sitting uh, because he's, he says to himself, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, he's, he's due for some kind of a, a judgment um, and I uh, could get caught in his mess. Uh, and using the same uh, reasoning, uh, Shmuel would only cross if there was a non-Jew in it, because in Shmuel's opinion, uh, the Satan, uh, which is a uh, not a person really uh, or uh, or a personage, but a uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, function. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a judgment delivering function um, uh, is uh, the Satan is not a multitasker. Uh, the Satan uh, can only deal uh, with one uh, uh, with with one nation uh, at a time. Uh, so, from Shmuel's perspective, uh, the safest thing that you can do uh, is, uh, is to uh, cross uh, with, uh, with uh, a non-Jew. Uh, Ravi uh, Yanai Badek Viavar. Um, uh, Ravi Yan, uh, strategy is to first examine uh, the ferry or the bridge, whichever it is, uh, and, and then cross if it it looked to be in good uh, condition, um, which seems like uh, an eminently uh, practical strategy. Um, uh, so Raviyanai Latama de Amar the Olam Al Ya Mod Adam Bimakom Sakana Lomar She Osimlo Nes Shema Ain Osimlo Nes. So um, Rabbi Yanai uh, says, um, in, in accordance with his his practical reasoning about first examining uh, the infrastructure, um, uh, he he says a person should uh, never put himself or herself in a condition of danger, uh, saying that, um, that heaven will perform a miracle for, for that person because uh, the person knows that they've been good. Uh, because uh, uh, maybe they won't get a miracle. 
Um, uh, in other words, Ravianai seems to believe that we don't know how miracles are distributed. And therefore, um, you know, we shouldn't assume that they're dis distributed on the, on the basis of how good you've been. Um, uh, and, and even, uh, even uh, more than, uh, than, than that, the uh, in uh, osin, and if it, the miracle was the im osin lo nes, menakin lo mi zichuyotab. Even if, if, if the miracle uh, did happen, it would bankrupt your merit account. Uh, uh, so uh, then we have um, uh, Amar Rav Hanin, uh, Maikra, uh, Rav, uh, 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 Hanin says, uh, you know, what's the verse that, that, that serves as a proof text for, uh, for that? Katonti mikol ha-chasadim u-mikol ha-emet. Um, uh, there's a, a, a verse about uh, Yaakov where he says, I'm, I'm not uh, worthy, I'm, I'm diminished of all of the mercies and all of the, all of the truth, um, uh, which uh, he's using to refer to the Zechut bank, uh, bank book. Um, uh, I've become smaller uh, in my in in my Zahut account, so uh, ultimately don't re rely on a miracle. It's chancy, and one way or the other, you couldn't afford it. So um, then uh, uh, we have um, uh, if we can uh, go uh, back up here. Uh, uh, what, what we uh, what we have is. Um, an account of um, uh, other ways uh, that um, that you can uh, uh, be uh, careful. If we, we, we're still on one thirty, so if you could move it over a little, that would help. Uh, 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 what we've got here. Uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, Rami Zera, uh, who was a uh, first generation Amora uh, in Eretz Yisrael, uh, who provides an example of Rami Yanai's uh, teachings. Uh, and that example is about not walking in a palm grove uh, when the fierce uh, wind that's blowing uh, could get your skull uh, crushed. Uh, if you've ever been in uh, LA when the Santa Ana wind uh, is blowing, uh, then uh, you, would, you would know what that is because palm branches are incredibly heavy. Uh, it's not like having maple leaves flutter down on your, on your head. So what Rav Zera seems to be saying is, it's up to you to use the sense God gave you to evaluate whether you are doing something safe. So the corollary seems to be that being human is a vulnerable and temporary. We can take away the uh, uh, tech now. Um, there are accidents, there are illnesses, um, Anything can happen to anyone, no matter how good they are. The human condition is not fair. We can take away the text. Uh, so now, um, this uh, conversation uh, is, is real different from uh, what's going to follow. What's going to follow is you get what you deserve. So be sure that you do teshuva constantly so God won't punish me, you. And what we just read in this last part is a minority view about risk and accident. And the, the minority view is very um, 
sophisticated, very um, thoughtful, because it says randomness is part of the universe. And it, randomness is not something that you can control. You can't control it by being good. You can't control it by anything, really. Um, so I think what we have to vote for is regarding women as part of the larger, more diversified category of normative human beings that we've been constructing here. Um, and I am going to vote for this theodicy where God isn't the ultimate patriarch and God isn't the micromanagerial proprietor of a perfectly patterned universe. God made room from the very beginning for randomness and evolution in the universe. And sometimes that produces wonders and sometimes it produces horrors, but God decided to leave the universe open-ended rather than static. All right, let's see what you, what you wanna um, argue about that. Okay, great. Yes, hi, uh, Rabbi Singer. Well, over to you. Hi, Rachel. Um, thank you so much for this very provocative lecture. Um, it's so, it, but it sounds like God makes room for uh, my my computer's freezing. But anyway, um, the God makes room for uh, randomness when it comes to men, but when it comes to women, they get punished for misdeeds. Is that the conclusion we draw from this? Uh, first of all, remember this is a this is a, um, this is theology and um, not law. Right. Um, all we have to do is abolish the category of women and uh, simply move them into the category of normative human being, and we have a workable theology here. I think that the way that the rabbis responded in the Gemara to the Mishnah says that they were already squirmy and they knew that these proofs were not good proofs. And in fact, one of the strategies is to change the subject. So, trying to shift away from the idea that um, women get punished, that it's more part of the randomness of the universe. That, the Mishnah doesn't have a legal leg to stand on. And the Gemara could be torn to pieces. And I only did a very, very slight attempt. I mean, if you want to have a second go at this, I, I bet that together we could just tear it to shreds. It's just not tenable. Thank you. Am I next? Yes, please, Aglaia, thank you. Okay, um, y'all please hear me out because this, this particular question annoys my students all the time, okay? <laughs> but um, we're talking about bad things happening, you know, bad, and I've done too much on theodicy, you know, from Leibniz to Voltaire's little trip to crazy town in Candide and such and, you know, so on and so forth. Carl Jung, all of that stuff. Um, one of the things that I usually bring up in class discussions is um, we look at all these bad things happening on a larger scale historically and everything. And then I'll just say to the students, okay, well, do you forgive history and so on and so forth. Um, my question is um, right now, and please don't get mad at me, anybody for saying this, so, but what about the human forgiving God for the misfortune? Okay, that's basically, I mean, I ask, usually my students get all up in arms when I say that, though, but then um, most of mine are Christians, so I have one line that I actually throw out at them and it shuts them up completely, though, so, but, um, yeah, do humans, can humans forgive God 
on the other side because, well, you've had this horrible thing happen to you. Is that part of, I love that um, sentence, being human is vulnerable. It seems to me that humans can, you humans speak out of, a, you know, a limited perspective. Mm -hmm. But um, if there's anything we learn from the book of Job, mm -hmm. it's that it, even God will be respectful of mm -hmm. that limited perspective, even though the whole thing is a whole lot more complex. The problem for Job is um, that, you know, God can tell him a whole bunch of things about how incredibly complex the universe is, but uh, Job is still saying, excuse me, I'm bleeding here. Um, <laughs> and those are, they're just kind of incompatible questions, but they're both legitimate and, and um, uh, serious uh, mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I, I think you might want to factor in here mm -hmm. is it's now, I think, becoming very difficult to extricate theodicy from, what shall I call it, sociodicy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole lot of things that are happening um, uh, that I don't think we can lay on God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, God didn't decide who was going to get access to COVID vaccines and who what wasn't. Uh, God uh, didn't uh, decide uh, who was going to get privilege and safety and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, God didn't decide, um, you know, uh, God didn't invent the uh, AI, AR-15. Uh, so um, it's now becoming, I think, very, very intricate to try to decide whose fault it is. Yes, yes. And frankly, I don't even know if that's a worthwhile enterprise. Right now, I don't, I don't give a blankety blank, uh, you know, whose, whose fault it is. The question is, what can we do to heal it? Can you come guest lecture for me? <laughs> it's basically what I was, yeah, thinking, but I just love that sentence, being human is vulnerable and what was it, vulnerable and temporary? Yeah. Who, uh, thank you. Who wants to jump in next with us? Hi, Toby. Hi. Yes. Yeah, here's a, here's a short and sweet version of I think what you said or maybe what I'm interpreting you said. If we, if we assume that God gave man free will, and that's a fair assumption, I think. Mm. Could we not attribute all this bad stuff to the consequences of man's free will if we wanted to? Human beings have choices. And human beings are able to do fairly awful things to other human beings. Um, and God can't prevent that really without interfering with free will. And, um, you know, I mean, it's kind of like uh, when kids are, 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 are little, they think uh, Abba and Ima can fix everything. My son once um, bit into a piece of wax fruit. Uh, he was really kind of indignant because he thought it was a piece of real fruit. But he then handed it to me and said, fix it. Yeah, you know, some things just you, it can't be fixed. You know, uh, if, if you did it, you, you did it. Um, I, I couldn't make the apple into a real, an unblemished apple again. It's just 
not doable. We have to learn that um, our acts have impact just like God's acts have impact. That's what's so impressive and also terrifying about being a human being. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Okay, time for one more question here. Someone we haven't heard from, let's see if there's any of them first. Okay, or someone we've heard from. Well, I just put in the chat something I read today from the, today's DAF about Abaye, who, yeah. made, who made the parents of another rabbi die by staring at them because he was mad at his decision on something. So I don't know what's wrong with that guy. <laughs> Do you know anything about his background? I think one of the things um, that's very hard to do uh, is to account for um, differences in context um, without being unduly judgmental. I mean, when I think about ways that we uh, have been purblind uh, about uh, injustices to the human beings around us. I think about trans people who, uh, in ways uh, that they have been wronged or overlooked. I think about um, uh, ways that people are ignorant uh, about um, uh, about uh, uh, you know Jews of of uh, various races. I think about. Um, uh, I think about just ways that uh, that um, uh, Ashkenazim get uh, uh, oblivious about about um, other Jewish tr uh, traditions. Uh, there, are, we're so limited. We're so ignorant. We can only work with our context and try to broaden our context the best we we can, you know, what, what Abaye probably needed um, uh, was, uh, I don't think he was in the same period, though he was, he was too late to have a heart to heart with Bruria, who might have set him straight. Wonderful. Uh, Professor Adler, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. We hope next week, oh, and uh, Dr. Heydrich, thank you for writing that in the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll take a read over there. Uh, we hope you'll join us next week for um, Is Peace Possible in Jerusalem with an activist uh, on the ground on East and West Jerusalem. Uh, that's happening next week. And thank you, Professor Adler and all of you and wishing everyone a wonderful day. And please join my Tuesday morning kindness class. Kindness every Tuesday at 10. Have a great day. Thank you.